Father, thank you so much for these folks that brave the cold to be here. And we pray that those who aren't here would get a chance to listen later. And yeah, we just, we just really pray today, Lord, that you would help me to speak and help us to listen to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's talk about this. God rested and pronounced everything he had made. Of course, we see this... Uh, I mean, verse 25, God saw that it was good. After every day, he said it was good. And of course, after he makes man, he says that it was very good. And of course, if God made a world that was very good, then we don't believe that things were messy or bad or there was sickness or death, that the world was, in fact, very good. Perfect and complete. I kind of have the imagery in my head of maybe some of you parents when you were having kids, you know, getting the nursery ready for the baby, right? Or, Excited, the baby's coming, and you're getting the nursery ready. I think in the same way God's preparing the earth for man. Uh, you don't have to turn here, but <clears throat> Isaiah 45 says just as much. I think that's also in your notes as well. Um, Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I think that is the verse against God using the evolution theory because, again, he created—he didn't just create the earth in vain for billions of years before we were here. No, in fact, he created it to be inhabited by, by people specifically. <clears throat> so why was creation perfect? Why was creation perfect? Well, because God is perfect. Those are, those are connections there. There was no sickness, death, or suffering and again, all of us live in a world full of sickness, death, and suffering, so this is indeed a world beyond what we can imagine. And of course, as we said last week, we're going to take this as literal history until we are given a reason not to, and we're not going to be given a reason not to. Again, if, if this isn't really what happened, then God could have told us what really happened, right? But indeed, I believe this is what, this is what happened to the first man and woman. <clears throat> and so as we ponder who and what mankind is, let's keep in mind... Those four big life questions we mentioned at the beginning. We're going to answer this week, who am I? And in some ways, where did I come from? And we're going to see that the Bible's answer is drastically different to our world's. <clears throat> and we will talk about that. So let's jump to Genesis 1, verse 26, if you are there. So, of course, God finished making those animals on the sixth day. So here's the end of the sixth day, 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. We'll get to what that means in a second. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. All right, so let's, let's take a look at this, kind of breaking it down verse by verse here. Verse 26, God is speaking, and yet he says, let us make man in our image. What is going on? What is going on? That is craziness. Why does God refer to himself as an us and, and as an our? Because we believe in more than one God, right? So it's, it's the council of gods coming together like the Mormons would teach, and this is, right? Very much a Trinitarian or a Trinity passage, okay? We're not made in the image of angels. You can read Hebrews chapter 1 about that one. So this is very much God in the Trinity speaking. <clears throat> what does, so we're going to talk about a little bit about what it means to be made in the image of God. Um, what does it? Genesis 5 says this. Uh, it says, The day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Okay, so the image of God, the likeness of God. What does this mean? Well, this means, first of all, that we are superior to animals. Mankind isn't an animal. Of course, the cultural lie, one of our cultural lies that we, we kind of fight each week and we talk about each week. One of the cultural lies that maybe you were taught in school and some of your kids will be taught in public school if you send them. We evolved from lower animals and we are only animals ourselves. Because of this, the animals, the trees, the earth are equal to us. Mankind is nothing special. And in fact, we are part of the problem as the polluters of the earth. <laughs> So that's kind of one of the lies that we're told is mankind is a plague on the earth and that, well, we're just animals. But the Bible teaches very differently than that. We even see here with the order that mankind is made after the other mammals, they are very different. <clears throat> 
And even in chapter 2, we're going to see that God makes everything by speaking, but then when he makes man, he forms us directly with his, with his hands, so to speak. And so God tells us right here in the very beginning that mankind is special and unique among all creation. Nothing else is said to have, to have the image of God. If you believe that you're just an animal that evolved from lower animals, how are you going to view yourself? We're talking about our friend Echo constantly running away from home. Do you think maybe, just maybe, that she has the wrong view of herself? Just using her as an example. And so many other people viewing themselves in the wrong way. Well, I, I am just an animal. I'm nothing special, so why should I care about anything? You know, the Bible has a very different view of mankind and womankind that we are indeed made in the image of God and we have great specialness and uniqueness and importance. Okay, so what does this mean that we're made in the image of God? Lots of heresy out there. Maybe you guys have listened to guys like Benny Hinn or Ken Kenneth Copeland or various guys on television. They teach kind of the little God's doctrine. Well, the, the fact that we're made in the image of God means that I'm a God. False. That's not what it means. Okay. Being made in the image of God doesn't mean that my physical body is made in the image of God. And why is that? Why is that? Because God doesn't have a, right? God doesn't have a body, right? Jesus does, but God does him, in, in who he is isn't a body. He's a soul and a spirit, or he's a spirit. Okay, so probably what he's talking about with the image of God is the fact that we have a soul and a spirit. <clears throat> or some people will just say soul and spirit are the same. We're not going to get into the two different views there. But there's an immaterial part of us that is not physical. I'm sure you would all, all agree. And here's what I wrote in my notes. The moral image of God. We are innately born with a conscience that praises us when we do good and condemns us when we do evil. Every culture instinctively knows what is right and wrong and most society's laws follow suit. And of course, here in the beginning, we just kind of debate, well, Adam didn't know right and wrong until he eats of the fruit and we're not going to get into that. But generally now, speaking of the image of God, there is that morality. I mean, you don't see a pack of wolves start a court and hold trials, right? They just kill each other, right? We're the only ones who have any sort of morality or um, any justice in our, <clears throat> in, our, in our culture, right? And of course, bringing us to another cultural lie that says that society is what determines what is right and wrong. So therefore, sins such as rape, murder, child molestation, that may be okay in some society out there, they would say. It's all subjective. I had a guy I worked with. I still work with him. And he's an atheist. And I always try and hold atheists to the fire and, and make them be consistent because they have to keep borrowing from my worldview to, to establish anything. And I asked him, I said, so how do you know what's right and wrong? And he said, well, society determines what's right and what's wrong. And I said, okay, so is there a society out there somewhere, just, just con maybe conceivably where, where child molestation in, in some culture out there might be okay? He says, well, yeah, because society determines what is right and what is wrong. And I looked at him and I said, you don't really believe that, do you? And he doesn't. He knows in in instinctively what is right, what is right and what is wrong. Cold-blooded murder is wrong in every situation. Child molestation, rape, and so forth. Roma, and Romans chapter 2 says the same. I want us as Christians, and this is me generally speaking of the Christian church, to believe our Bibles. Because the Bible says we know what is right and wrong. The Bible says we know that God exists from creation and from conscience. And Romans 2 says as much in verse 14, there in your notes. For when Gentiles, which is us if we're not Jews, who do not have the law... So they don't have, nobody told them it was right and wrong. By nature, do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, right? And so we know that indeed we know what is what's up, right? We know what's right and what's wrong. This is because we are created in the image of God. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this. Some other things that are a little bit different that makes us different from the other things. Well, here's another one. God has given us a mind to know God and to understand him. Jeremiah 9. <clears throat> Jeremiah 9. Of course, you have all the stuff in your notes, which makes it easier on me. Jeremiah 9. One of, one of my favorite verses. One of my favorite verses. 
What does God delight in? What does God want from me? Well, here's one of the many verses that tells us the mind of God. Jeremiah 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not, wise, let, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories or boasts, in, uh, let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me. And so God not only made it possible to know and to understand him, but he wants us to know and to understand him. And he's given us, indeed, his Bible and his word there to, to do so. Just throwing this out there, but Christianity does involve some thinking. I know a lot of people go, well, you Christians are dumb as a doornail, and you don't think everything you do is just blind faith. Christianity is not just blind faith, blind trust, or blind obedience. It is very much a thinking, um, not just thinking, but there is an aspect where we do think things through, right? We do think sometimes, right? Sometimes, folks? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so God gave us a mind to know him. Th these are really easy to remember, so I'll ask you to review these next week. God also gave us emotions to love him. Now, emotions are not to run our lives, ladies and guys, <laughs> nor our experiences to be what governs truth. Well, what I believe is true for me and what you believe is true for you, that is not true. What is true is true is because it's true. People will ask, well, why is Christianity true? I'll say because it's true. Christianity isn't true because it worked for me, though it did. Christianity is true even if I reject it. It is true because God says it is true. And yet, even so, God has given us an emotional core that can love, be grieved, that can hate feel pain, and all sorts of other feelings. We read in the Bible that God can be grieved, right? Right before the flood, grieves God's heart. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, angry, and that God loves. Well, where do we get those emotions from? We get them from him. By the way, where do we get sarcasm from? Read through some of the prophets. God's very sarcastic, which is why I think I'm so much holier than all of you, because I'm the most sarcastic. <laughs> it's not true, not true. God has enabled us to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. And most of all, he wants us to love him freely and of our own choice. And this brings us to the next one. So we have a mind to know and understand God, emotions to love God, and a free will to obey God. Now, question for you. Could God have made humanity a bunch of robots that would just obey every command? Could he have? He could have. Or he could have. But he didn't. He could have made us a bunch of robots who would serve him and love him, and yet this is not what God has chosen to do. Love freely chosen is better than love forced. I want you to imagine, I'm, whatever, me, I'm going to make fun of Nike here. I got a girl Nike likes. I usually use myself as the example, but I'm going to use you as the example. There's a girl you like. I give her 50 bucks and say, go tell him you love him. And go ask him out on a date. And he's like, yes, she, she loves me. And then he finds out, oh, she got paid 50 bucks. She was coerced. Wouldn't feel that good about that, right? <laughs> right? And so God, being infinitely more wise than us, I think gets, if he's forcing everyone to love him like pawns on a chessboard, that's not really love. It's just puppets, silliness. Maybe you're asking, why would God risk man not choosing him by giving him a free will and it's because he wants real love and of course we're going to see in genesis 3 that indeed mankind has in the beginning and since then typically chooses to not follow him but there are some who do okay and so in verse 20 uh 26 and 27 it also talks about mankind um having dominion over the earth so we're stewards or co-regents over god's creation you know what a steward is? You're somebody who's running somebody else's estate. You're taking care of somebody else's stuff. So God really is putting mankind in charge of running things. In his sovereignty, giving mankind responsibility as image bearers on the earth. Um, nobody brought me a mirror, so I'm not going to do my illustration. <laughs> I was going to flash a flashlight into a mirror. The idea being that God's glory the whole point of being the image of God is God shines down his glory, who he is, and we're supposed to reflect to the rest of the creation who he is. And then, of course, the reason I said I was going to break the mirror is because what happens when we fall into sin is we smash the mirror. God tries to shine his glory through, and it's just a big mess. We misrepresent God, right, because of, because of the way we live. 
and because of what we are. And so we see this from the very beginning that men was supposed to be stewards, having dominion over the earth. Not that we pollute or litter or just be disgusting pigs, but that we are indeed taking care of the earth. But it does mean that we chop down trees because we use it. We dig up stuff to use. We dig up oil. We use gas. Okay, so this isn't the, the hyper-environmentalism where we aren't even to cut down a tree. And no, no, we're, we are called to use the earth in a responsible manner. Okay, so beginning, uh, continuing here in verse 27, talking about the image of God. Let's read verse 27 again. And we're going to get into genders, which is, I can't believe I even have to explain this, but we do live in 2015. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, a lot of confusion in our culture about gender. Folks, you older people, back in the day, like 30, 40 years ago, was gender and sex the same thing? Like it's male and female, right? D does it mean the same thing or does, does it actually have a different meaning? Gender and sex are the same thing, right? Okay, well, nowadays they're saying, well, sex is one thing, male and female, but gender means a whole bunch of other things. This is what we are being taught in our public schools and it's just being pushed. Um, Bible teaches very clearly that there are two genders or two sexes, male and female. Some of you young men probably have noticed that girls look different than you. <laughs> That you look nice, usually. Sex and gender. <laughs> Turns out old you are. Here's a. I went into Google, and all I typed was, How many genders are there? How many genders are there? Well, we would say two. Well, here's a quote I found online. And this is very much the mindset that's being prevalent in our culture. Frankly, if I were to preach what I'm about to preach 10 to 15 years from now, I would probably be thrown into prison for hate crimes, to be completely honest. That's where we're headed. Um, so posting sermons online may not be the wisest thing to do, but I'm okay with that. Well, here's the, here's the quote, and you can be weirded out. And by the way, my spell check was going off the entire time. Like, what is this word? Well, in fact, they've made up new words. Let's read this. Quote, there are male people, and there... And I don't want to mock this, because the person who wrote this, did they need to, to know Jesus and be saved? Like, like, yes, right? So it's not like, oh, well, this person's lost and there's no hope. There is hope for the transgender person and the gay person and the lesbian person or the bisexual person or the 80 other things they have to say here. There is hope for them. Not just for forgiveness, but just like we talked about this morning, to be changed, right? To be what God made them to be. Let's read this. There are male people and female people. There are people who feel... Notice the emotions driving things. They feel they have no gender at all, or a gender. A gender. Occasionally genderless. There are people who have a gender that is in between. There are people who have a distinct gender altogether, or a third gender. There are people whose gender changes, gender fluid. And I had in brackets, my spell check's going crazy <laughs> in my notes. Didn't post that in yours. There are people who also have more than one gender at a time, bi-gender or tri-gender. Here's what the article ended with. Note also that one's physical body doesn't have to match their gender or the idea of being transgendered. Folks, that's the planet we're living on. That's the culture we're in. And by the way, this is where the church is headed. They are ordaining homosexual people to be pastors, transgender people to be pastors. So we have to hold on to this. Pretty interesting, though. Isn't that just reading that? It's like, what? I was surprised. Now, who defines all these terms? Who is this author's and our, and our culture's authority on the matter? We will see in a few weeks that these views exist because there is a very real Satan and there is a very real truth that mankind has fallen into sin and that we are destroying this world. And yet God in the very beginning, which is why we're teaching foundational Bible teaching, said there are two genders, male and female. Next week we're going to talk about that marriage relationship. The differences between our world and the biblical worldview is drastic. And these people are violently opposed to, to the biblical worldview. I mean, they are militant to get into the church. 
There's a guy actually going around. His name is Matthew Vines. You can Google him if you want. But he, he actually goes from church to church teaching on um, this, equipping churches to um, accept homosexuals. Now, as a church, do we accept homosexuals? The answer is yes, we do. But there's a difference between you're welcome here to hear the gospel and what you're doing is okay. Now, one of you has a gambling problem. Maybe some of you young guys have a pornography problem. Is that okay? No, that's not okay either, right? We don't pick and choose this sin is worse. This No, no. Sin is sin. Repent and stop sinning. Deal with it. Get help if you're struggling, please, with whatever it is. But what this guy is trying to do in the churches, especially just with all these different genders and views coming out, is not only do we want the church to let us in, we want the church to accept us, we want the church to say that what we do is okay and to justify the way we live. Is that loving? Let's just talk about that for a second. Is that loving when somebody living in sin and we just say, well, you're not living in sin and you're okay? Is that loving? That, that isn't very loving. You know, if a doctor, Daryl, you were sick with cancer before, correct? Would that, that would have been loving for the doctor to just not tell you about it and not give you any treatment, just leave you alone. Because he hurt your feelings when he told you, right? But that was the most loving thing he could have done for you, right? And in the same way, using you as an example there, bud, is, is we love people enough to call them out. And please love me enough to call me out on my sin as well. So someday if we do Romans 1 at length, we'll talk more about that. We did do Romans 1, but we can do a whole, whole session on that. All right, let's continue. Verse 28. All that stuff just breaks my heart and just makes me realize how much I need Jesus. Verse 28. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. What does that mean? It says, mean, basically, you have sex and have lots of kids. Do it. Good. This is great. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every green herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, and to you it shall be for food. So everybody was a vegetarian, it seems, because we hear about after the flood, man begins eating meat, and God says it's okay. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he has made, and indeed it was very good. So evening and morning were the sixth day, and of course the seventh day we know he rested. Okay, so have lots of kids. Family is good. It was God's idea. There's various views on that. It's not really something we're going to be legalistic about, but in the beginning God said, have lots of kids. Now, we live in a culture <laughs> that hates children. I mean, let's be completely honest. We live in a culture that hates children. 3,000 abortions a day in the States. But even in the Christian church, families with many kids in some churches are looked down on. Oh, I feel bad for them. They got like eight kids. It's kind of bad for them. Or maybe sometimes you'll, you'll hear somebody where, oh, we thought, we thought my wife was pregnant, but while well, she wasn't, whew. How funny in a way that is, but how unbiblical is that? And actually how hateful is that towards, towards children? Psalm 127, verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. As in the quiver, you know, the arrow quiver? Fill your quiver with kids. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. So fill your quiver with kids. Amen. Praise Jesus. <laughs> so we'll move on from that. <laughs> Uh, man alone could not have subdued and ruled the earth. Okay, Adam, you have no wife. Have fun subduing the earth by yourself. Would have had some trouble fighting the lion or whatever. So he needed a wife as his helper. We'll talk about the gender roles next week. If you want to get offended, come back next week. You'll be offended by the gender roles. You'll be quite, quite offended by that one. Even some of you very godly ladies, I'm just like, this is, hmm, is that really? Yes, indeed, gender roles are biblical. Of course, and then of course, their future kids to spread out among the earth. Be God's image bearers all across the earth. And think about this. Where are the places with the most crime on the earth? It's the place where people stay together and build a big city, right? So God says, spread out, right? The Tower of Babel, what do they do? Well, let's stay here. God said, spread out. They said, no, we're going to live here and build a tower. Take over the universe. Well, we'll see what happens to them if we get that far. We are made to be God's representatives on the earth. Not as little gods or any kind of, kind of deity, but... Created creatures made with dignity and purpose. We can't forget this, especially as we deal with hurting people in our world. Our purpose, 
reflecting the glory of God, to glorify him and enjoy him forever, to live on, enjoy, and take care of his planet. Now, taking care of his planet isn't our primary mean, but it is there. The old confession, I don't know if it's the Westminster Confession, asks, it's like a catechism, and it asks the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I think there's something very, very good about that. Okay, so let's move on now from the image of God to the garden and the two trees in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, we're going to talk about this. These, remember, this was adapted from a Bible study, and so we're going to have weeks where things look, seem a little disjointed. 2 verse 7. Okay, we, before we read, a um, little bit of controversy. Some people will say that chapters 1 and chapter 2 is a contradiction. Go home and read them. You'll notice some things that are a little strange. Because already in chapter 1, it taught that male and female were created. But then in chapter 2, it tells us that male and female were made again. So what's up with that? Chapter 2 has God making some animals again, making the garden uh, after he made everything. Here's basically what's going on. Maybe some of you didn't catch that. and doesn't, whatever. But basically what's happening is this. Chapter 1 is an overview of the seven days of creation. And chapter 2 is zooming in on the sixth day and saying, okay, male and female were created. How did that happen? God made him from the dust, breathed life into him, took the rib and made the woman and all that. Okay. And so I think that's very much... Um, what is happening. And I think also the reason why God's making stuff is that he's making it before Adam's very eyes. Why, wouldn't, why would that be important, that he makes things in front of him? Because Adam was the last thing that was made, right? And so how does Adam know that God is God? He didn't see him make anything, right? And so maybe he did this to kind of show him. Because imagine, I mean, if God didn't have, wouldn't have done this, Satan could have walked up to Adam and said, hey, do you like this earth that I've made? And how would he know? How would he know the difference? And of course, in verse 9, uh, well, let's read 7 to 9. 2, two 7 to 9. The Lord formed man out, out, uh, out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, which he did to n nobody else, just us. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden... And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So notice, he's not making every tree, just trees that are pleasant to the sight and good for food. So he's making the garden for him. The earth is already made. He's just, now he's just making the garden for him. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll get to that in a sec. Okay, so God plants this beautiful garden. I want you to notice, he didn't ask Adam, Adam, I've made a beautiful garden for you. Would you like to go there? What does he do? He places him in the garden. Why? What right does God have to not ask him his opinion and just to place him in the garden? Well, what have we learned about God's sovereignty, right? God says, you go here. Yes, sir. That's the way it was. God knows what is best. At this point, Adam is completely dependent on God for all he has and for every decision he makes. This is a wise thing to do, even for us, and how we were originally made to be. Again, if God is good, loving, and perfect, which he is, then if we asked what we should do in any situation, his answer would be best, would it not? I mean, our life isn't messed up because we obey God. Our life is messed up because we disobey God. Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> now today, we have the word of God to help us make decisions. Before we make any decision, what does God's word say? Okay, now let's get into these two special trees. Has anybody ever read this story about the Garden of Eden before? Okay, some of you. How many of you have struggled with this story? Just struggled with what is even going on here? I definitely have, and that's why we're going to talk about it. <coughs> now again, some will say this isn't literal history. This is just an allegory teaching spiritual truth. But again, I say, if something else happened, why didn't God just tell us what happened? Indeed, I think there was, there was two trees. So let's read this in two... Verse 15, he talks about some of the rivers God made. We're not going to get into that, so let's jump to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So two trees. Tree of life. We're not going to talk too much about because we don't know much about it. But apparently, if Adam would eat of the tree, 
he would live forever. And I am of the personal opinion that before man sinned, he would have lived forever anyway. That's how we were made. But if he wouldn't have sinned, he would have had the tree, so he would have lived forever anyway. Either way, it would have been that. Let's talk a little bit about the tree of of the knowledge of good and evil here. This was another tree in the garden. It says that it was in the midst of the garden. But this is where I want to contradict most Sunday school pictures of the tree. Because a lot of pictures, when they show the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it'll be this clearing in the garden with a gigantic, golden, beautiful, shining tree. And God's like, you live here and stand beside this and don't get tempted. We'll we'll see you you later. And it's just this view that, that God's just setting him up pretty much to fail. It's this big, shine. No, it's just, it's one of the trees in the garden. He didn't always have to be around it. Maybe he didn't see it for weeks at a time. Keep in mind, as we go through this, God's character. Why did we teach on the attributes of God for the last, like, five weeks? Because of this. I did a Bible study on this one time. Uh, I've done this a couple times through Bible study, but... One of the reasons I tell people, come at the very beginning of the study. If you don't, you're going to be confused. A girl came in, and we were teaching on, actually, Genesis 3, the fall. Well, halfway through, she was crying, and she says, how could God do that? How, what right does he have to put the tree there? And he's setting them up, and what's going on? And I was like, this is why you needed to be here from the beginning. She was so upset. And even, you know, a lot of critics will say, well, how could God do this? How could God do that? Well, again, establishing that foundation of who God is. Remember, and he, remember here in verse uh, uh, verse 9, Out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So this wasn't the only good-looking tree. Everything was pleasant to the sight and good for food. This wasn't the only... It's not like there was a bunch of crap trees and one good tree. They were all good trees. You're going to hear me rant and rave a little bit about this one because I think we do, we do need to hear that. Um, was the tree in and of itself evil? Was it? God created something evil? It can't be. It, just because who God is, he can't create evil. He's good and perfect. God didn't create evil, and God is not evil. Did God know about it before it existed? Indeed, he did. The issue here is not so much the trees, but would Adam depend on God to know what was good and what was evil? Or would he go elsewhere seeking this knowledge? That's the issue. God intended that whenever Adam needed to know what he should do, he was to look to God for direction. This is basically my kind of mindset on this. If Adam would, would pre-sin, pre-fall, we're talking about the fall of man, which is when man falls into sin. There's a point where Adam didn't know what to do. He would walk up to God and say, God, what do I do? I don't know. And God would give him direction. I think that is, is the point. Adam was to depend on God at all times to tell him the right thing to do. God would always choose what is best. Contrary to our culture, God has not left it up to us to decide what is right and wrong. God's word has not changed. And I think I had this in my notes later, um, but I'm going to talk about it now. The command to not eat of the fruit is the issue, but it also isn't. It could have been any command. It could have been, Adam, don't leave the garden. It could have been, Adam, don't stand on your head. It doesn't matter. The issue is, would he listen to what God had to say? Which is why in Genesis 3, when Satan comes, who was the first thing Satan asks? Did God really say? Right, so that's the issue. Let's talk about this warning. This warning. God gives Adam a warning about the tree. Don't eat of it or you will surely die. Now, some of you parents maybe have threatened punishment and then changed your mind or relented. Has that ever happened to maybe some of you? Never me. Well, okay. Like a parent who threatens to punish... Does God change his mind? Indeed, no. And God promises something. He does it. You guys ever read through the book of Lamentations? Depressing. Lamentations is Jeremiah sitting outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in flames. I mean, it, it is destroyed. And you know that song? Great is thy faithfulness, O God. You know where that's from? The book of Lamentations. Where he is standing at the burning city... And he says, well, God, you keep your promises for good, but you also keep your promise when you promise to punish us. Great is your faithfulness. That's where we get the song from. See, because God is also faithful to punish, not just faithful to give us the things we like. 
Okay, and so God here in Genesis 1 says, you will surely die. Now, what does God mean by death? We'll talk about this for a second. Now, we believe that at this point, there was no death in the world. Now, some will say man brought mankind's death in the world. I believe that animals and man and birds, they, they didn't die. And I don't think plants are living in the, in the biblical sense. They didn't have the breath of life in them and, and so forth. There was no sickness, suffering, or death in the world. Isaiah chapter 11, turn with me if you want, beginning in verse 6. I think this gives, us a, this gives us a little bit of a hint as to what the world was like before the fall, because this verse is about when Jesus returns and restores the world to the way it used to be. So, if this is the way it used to be, maybe this is the way the garden was. Isaiah 11, verse 6. Just an incredible passage. Isaiah 11, verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Now wait. There, Mr. Preacher. Today the wolves eat the lamb. They do not dwell with them. Indeed. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Leopards eat young goats today. The calf and the lion and the fatting and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. <laughs> right? Like we don't have this in our world. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. This is prophecy of the future, but this is the way it used to be. And that's one of the issues with saying, well, there was death before Adam and evolution. Well, if God is going to restore the world back to the way it was, if it was already full of death, then what's he restoring it to? <laughs> How has it changed? I love this one in verse 8. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra. Why? Because the cobra is not going to harm him in this world. In, before the fall, and when Jesus comes to fix things. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adders then. An adder is a type of snake. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so I think this is a good verse that indicates what the world was like before we brought sin into the world. Now maybe you're thinking, ah, sin isn't that big of a deal. Look what we did to the world. Things used to be good. Living in a junkyard now. I want you to imagine I buy a Ford van and I crash it. I drive it back to the dealership, and I say, why did you make my van this way? He didn't make it that way. Originally, he made it perfectly good. You ruined it. People ask, why is the world messed up? You're here, and I'm here. That's why the world's messed up. All right, so maybe I'm yelling more and more each week. Death in the Bible. Let's talk about it. When the Bible speaks of death, now, when we think of death, I think some of us think of, like, ceasing to exist. So poof, we're dead. But biblically, the idea of death is always the idea of separation. Always the idea of separation. Okay? When your car engine dies, it doesn't work anymore, but the physical engine is still there. If I were to drop dead right now, don't, don't kill me. Now, this isn't a video game. When I die, my body doesn't just disappear and respawn, right? For those of you who play games, probably just me and Nike. <clears throat> we don't just respawn, right? Yeah. Though that would be cool. The body's still there, right? So, so what's happened? You're dead, but something is separated from your body, correct? And that's what it is. So the Bible speaks of three different kinds of death. I'll, I'll, I'll ask about this next week as well for review. Ways that were made in the image of God. We have a mind to know God, emotions to love God, and a will to obey God. And of course, we'll talk about <clears throat> the three kinds of death. Here they are. The first kind of death. If Adam took the fruit, and we haven't been there yet, so maybe he won't, but we know he does. Spiritual death. Adam, this is the first kind of death. Adam would be immediately separated from God's presence. The relationship and spiritual union Adam had with God would immediately be cut off and separated. They would no longer be in relationship but they would be enemies. Romans chapter 5, you can read about the fact that we are God's enemies before becoming Christians. So spiritual death, there's a, there's, a, there's a broken relationship. Physical death. Instead of eating of the tree of life and living forever, he would eventually die a physical death and his soul would separate from his body. So you see this idea of separation. This is a really bad news. Third kind of death, eternal death, or the second death. Revelation talks about the second death. This would be a continuation of the separation Adam had with God while he was alive. And I think I'm going to stop the series for about a week, and we're going to talk about total depravity and sin, because I think we need to. Um, 
This would be a continuation of the separation Adam had with God while he was still alive. So the, rela- so the relationship is broken. If he dies in this broken relationship, he'd be, he would just continue to be separated from God forever. Unless Adam could find a way to restore this relationship to God before he died, the separation between them would become permanent and unchangeable. And by the way, there is no way Adam could have fixed the relationship once he, once he breaks it. <laughs> God has to become a man <laughs> and fix it for us. As the old saying goes, if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. God says, <laughs> and God indeed, that's exactly what he did. God sent prophets, God sent kings, God sent judges, they all failed. God said, okay, this was my plan from the very beginning to come, to die for you anyways. Now, skeptics will say in Genesis 3, see, Adam ate the fruit, but he didn't die. So Satan was right. God did lie. And yet, when he eats of the fruit, he doesn't immediately die, but he does immediately die spiritually, as we will see. And we're going to see Adam's reaction to God very much as evidence that he indeed was separated from God. Now, again, my illustrations I think of, and I never actually get the props for them because I'm just lazy. I don't know. Plus, it's winter so much. I want to find like a leafy branch, but I'm always preaching this in the winter. Imagine if I broke a branch, a nice green leafy branch off of a tree full of green leaves. Would it immediately turn brown or rot? Why? But is the branch dead? When you break the branch off the tree, it's pretty much dead, right? And so we see this the same with Adam. Adam's relationship is he's cut, off, he's cut off from his source of life, just like a branch on a tree. And he lives for 900 more years, but he does eventually die. And by the way, those lifespans continue to shrink until we're to where we are, where 70 is considered, considered pretty old nowadays. You're not going to reach 100, really. It's, it's pretty rare. Um, but is it dead? Yes. So in the same way, if Adam disobeyed God, he would be cut off from the life of God and would be on his way to the grave. Okay, final thoughts on the tree. Here's my last round and we'll be done. <clears throat> Sorry, bud. <laughs> final thoughts for you. Adam had never seen death at this point. Some would ask, did Adam truly understand what it meant for him to die? He's never seen death, so God says, you're going to die. Some people would say, well, Adam would say, well, what's the, what's, the, what's the big deal? Well, again, back to God's character. Since God is righteous and loving, he would have made it clear to Adam that death meant his relationship with God would cease. We can be sure of that, even if the Bible doesn't say it, because we know God's character. Not to believe God made this clear is to call God's character into question which we will not do. We talked about who God is before this lesson because it helps us understand this situation better. The tree was, this is pretty important, the tree was not a trick to make Adam sin. He wasn't setting him up to fail. God made it clear. And I believe this, I can't get this from scripture, but I believe this was some sort of a testing period where honestly, because I think the angels fell a little bit before this, we'll get into that in two weeks, I think. Um, there would have been a point where eventually the tree was gone and they would have just lived on. It would have been fine. God, Adam just had to depend on God through it. And keep this in mind, too. Adam didn't have a sin nature. So it's not like on his own he would have just chosen sin. This is where Satan comes in and deceives his wife. And also how Adam was called to lead his wife, which we will get to later. And I believe he failed horribly, which is why the fall happened. Even though Adam may not have understood how extreme death was, God would have given him sufficient understanding to know that God's judgment was something to be greatly feared and avoided. Amen? God's judgment is something we, we do fear and avoid. You know, some people will ask, well, what, you're just a Christian because you want to get out of hell free card? Yeah, <laughs> I do want to get out of hell. Yes, I want relationship with him too and to live as I've been created, but yeah, I do fear God. Do you? Adam was created right from the hand of God. He was not a moron. Adam was smarter than you. He was smarter than me. Evolution teaches we used to be dumb and small and weak and we're getting bigger and stronger and smarter and faster. But in reality, the Bible actually teaches that Adam lived to be 900 years old and it's been worse, actually. And of course, the Bible doesn't record everything they, ta they, they talked about. Um, I believe Adam could have been in the garden even 100 years before he fell, but we'll get into that. Sometime I'm here, I guess. James chapter 1 is in your notes, and this is an important one that I think is going to help us understand this. And we are kind of jumping ahead because he hasn't fallen yet, but I wanted to...
to get to this. <clears throat> James 1 verse 13. Well, God is tempting him. So this is unfair. Well, let's, let's go to James. <clears throat> James 1 verse 13. This is a direct answer to that claim God is tempting Adam. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Why? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Amen. So is this tree set up to make him fail? No. Was this set up to tempt him? No. By the way, testing and tempting are, are very different things. Right? Now, did God, did God know Adam would choose sin? Yeah. But did Adam make the free choice? Yeah. Did God make him make the free choice? No, it was a free choice. Why such a seemingly harsh penalty? It's a fruit off a freaking tree, right? Like it's just a fruit off a tree. This could have been anything. Like I mentioned, don't leave the garden. Don't stand on your head. It really doesn't matter. This is all about obedience and dependence on God. This shows our absolute need for God to literally sustain us in life, in every decision, in every thought. And of course, we live between Genesis 3 and Revelation 20, where the world is messed up. And so this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. And you know, like I mentioned, how our hearts blame God for this event. Why did he even put up the tree? Why would he give mankind free will? Why didn't he stop Satan? And you know what? That's just us making excuses. The question we should really be asking is, how could Adam and Eve rebel against the God who has only been good to them? Hmm. That's maybe think of it that way. God had provided for their every need. It's not like there was no food, and while I was hungry, God, and this was the only tree you put, that was kind of a setup. No, it was an incredible place. The food probably tasted fantastic. People will say, God, how could you? But the real question is, is Adam, how could you? And yet, if we're honest, are we any better than him? Well, if I was in the garden, I wouldn't have fallen just... But this time of testing was something God, who is totally sovereign over creation, including mankind, something he had decided to do. You say, why did he do this? I don't know. But he's God and he decided to do it, which means what he did was best. And if it was, then it was the right and best thing to do. Mankind had every resource available to walk with God and to continue right on in paradise forever and ever. And praise God, someday Jesus Christ will come back, destroy his enemies first, but then he will have us on paradise forever and ever if we are believers and as we will see next week adam had clear directions from god to love lead and protect his wife from satan's lies but for whatever reason he chose to be passive we're going to find out that uh, well we'll talk about it when we, when we get there but i believe the man indeed had that role to protect her and he he utterly failed which by the way i think is one of the biggest problems in the church today as well Conclusion, and then we'll finish. Thanks for listening. We'll conclude what we were talking about here. Mankind was made in the image of God, giving us inherent value above all other creatures God had made. We are special, and we have a God-given ability to relate to God with our mind and with our will and with our emotions in ways nothing else can. Men and women were created equal in the eyes of God, but with different roles, and we'll talk about that next week. God in his goodness, with everything he has lovingly provided Adam and Eve, has every right to expect full obedience from them. There was no reason to disobey God. There was no reason. He had been nothing but good to them. Imagine getting to walk and talk with God in the garden during the cool of the day. Can you imagine how cool that would be? Well, cool today, but cool like good. He said, don't take from this tree. God gives them no reason not to trust him. He has been nothing but completely trustworthy. And that's part of Satan's lie is getting them to doubt God's trustworthiness. Adam could literally have done anything he wanted. He was told to just not do one thing. And as we get into gender roles next week, indeed, I believe that is exactly what we're being deceived with today. We want to do the one thing we can't do. God has given mankind a free will to choose. Would they go to God and ask what is right and wrong, or would they define it for themselves? Well, you have me apparently till the end of June now, John. <laughs> Unless I'm here the first week of April, then you're firing me. <clears throat> so we are going to get through some of this, and I can now I can take my time and maybe do some extra stuff. But 
I'll be completely honest. The next few weeks are going to be pretty depressing. Next week will be marriage. You guys can laugh at me. Ha, ha, ha. But, but we're doing, then we're doing the fall of Lucifer. Then we're doing the fall of man. Then we're doing the curse on the earth. It's going to be depresso, but I love Genesis 3 has the gospel in it. Let's see if you can find it when you go home. The gospel's in Genesis 3, I think verse 15. We have established so far, God is good and kind to all his creatures. God has a sovereign right to expect obedience from his creatures, and he has every right to deal with those who rebel against him. Well, God, your punishment is a little too severe. No, his punishment is perfectly just for what has happened. But let's continue this chronologically. We talked about the fall, but chronologically next week, God is perfect. He's made a perfect world. The angels are innocent still. Man is perfect. We're going to talk about marriage. It'll be fun. We'll talk about it then. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, thank you that you created us with inherent value and worth. Um, thank you that our worth really is just based on your glory and who you are. Um, apart from you, I don't have much worth, but I know that in you I do have of infinite worth. And so thank you, Lord, for that. And, and God, as we, as we think through, yeah, this whole garden story, it's tough. And there are many questions we have, and some questions we won't get until we get to heaven and you can show us the video. But, God, I, I, I thank you that your word is clear, that you are good and holy and trustworthy. And, God, that even in our lives, we don't have to rebel against you, that there is a way out. There is an escape from those things that come in our way and tempt us. And so, God, I pray that we would trust you and walk with you. Lord, Satan lies to us, we lie to ourselves, and the world lies to us, but you don't lie to us. And so, God, we can trust you, we can trust your word. <clears throat> so, yeah, as I'm going to be here a bit longer, Lord. I just pray that you would bless us as we continue to go through your word and continue to bless this church as they search for a pastor. In Jesus' name.